President Volodymyr Zelensky says Ukraine needs long-range missiles following a barrage of attacks by Russia. And a Ukrainian diplomat says that Western allies are going to be sending more than 300 tanks to Ukraine. Let's get you updated on all of this with CNN senior international correspondent Fred Plykin. He's live for us in Kramatorsk. Uh, Fred, Ukraine says that it is in a race against time to get these additional weapons. Mm. Uh, bring us up to speed. What's the latest? Well, well uh, certainly from the vantage point here, it seems as uh, though they possibly are in a race against time. If you look at the area around where I am in the east of the country, we're certainly right now, Boris, uh, the, the bulk of the heavy fighting is going on. And we have had some rocket attacks by the Russians in villages not far from where I am right now. And of course, you have that main battlefront right now in the town of Bakhmut. And when the Ukrainians say they're in a race against time, they obviously mean that they need those main battle tanks from the west as fast as possible. And if you look at the battles that are going on here in the east, Tanks play a major role, both in their classic role of, of conducting attacks, for instance, but also when they're being used as artillery when it comes to fighting around cities. We visited a tank unit here in one of the hardest hit areas by the war around Bakhmut. Here's what we saw. Revving like a dragster, the crew from the 28th Mechanized Brigade warm up their Soviet-era T-64 for battle. We have problems with ammunition. We're running low, the commander tells me. And that's the only problem we have. We get enough spare parts. Our commanders work all the time to sustain the tank and repair it. That commander, who goes by the call sign David, races the 40-year-old beast towards the front line like a steam engine train. A lot of Ukraine's main battle tanks are as old as this one. That's why the military says they urgently need those new Western main battle tanks. They say around three to 400 to try and turn the tide in this war. The problem, Ukraine is running out of Soviet era tanks and is having increasing trouble replacing those lost in battle or needing repair. The 28th helped liberate Kherson in the South and then was sent here. It's already been a long war for this unit. Ukrainian soldiers on the front around Bakhmut are elated. Western nations are sending modern battle tanks, M1A2 Abrams from the US, German-made Leopard 2s, and British Challenger tanks. But the Ukrainians are also masters at using the old Soviet tanks they have now to best effect. Firing, reloading, taking aim, and quickly shooting again. The tank engineer, who only gave his name as Maxim, says the soldiers from the 28th could operate these vehicles blindfolded. If we fire from a covered position, we use this device, he says. It's old and analog, but pretty efficient, very precise. Ukraine's forces say their tanks have been extremely important and effective here in Bakhmut, taking on the mercenaries of Russia's Wagner private military company, who often use convicts as cannon fodder to try and storm Ukrainian positions with almost no fire support. The tank commander says they're constantly working to stop Wagner's advances here. We just fight against them. If we stop, they will come closer and we will lose our houses and families. We stand here to allow people to peacefully live in their homes. But Ukraine's army is under growing pressure around Bakhmut as the Russians pour more armor into this area. The promised Western tanks probably won't arrive fast enough to make a difference in this battle. But these soldiers hope they will turn the tide of the war. So there you can see, guys, that the Ukrainians obviously saying they need a lot of those Western main battle tanks. And they do think that that will make a big difference on the battlefield, especially if they want to take the fight to the Russians and win back some of those territories that the Russians uh, got at the beginning of this war. The other thing, of course, as you guys mentioned, is those longer distance missiles, those attackums that the uh, Ukrainians also want to have. They say the main reason for that is that after they got the multiple rocket launchers from the U.S., they were able to hit some supply lines from the Russians, take some of those out. But they say now the Russians have simply moved those supply lines further away from the front line. So the Ukrainians say they need longer distance capabilities to be able to hit those as well. Of course, we know that the Biden administration so far is not willing to give those missiles just yet. The Leopard tanks will probably get there from the Germans and from their uh, our European allies and partners will get there uh, in relatively short order, uh, pr probably in time to help them uh, in the spring and, and summer. The American tanks, the Abrams, will take a little bit more time. It'll take many months before they can get on the ground.
Joining us now is senior military analyst Colonel Cedric Layton. So Colonel Layton, German Leopard tanks could be there relatively soon. As you heard there, though, from John Kirby, the Abrams tanks, it could take a while. Are they going to get there too late? Well, it really depends, Pamela. And, you know, when you look at the difference, first of all, uh, you, they've talked about 321 tanks, according to the Ukrainian ambassador to France, being sent to Ukraine. So that's a large number. That is basically what the Ukrainians asked for. They asked for around 300 to 400 tanks. So they're getting what they need. Mm -hmm. But let's take a look at the Leopard tank. So this is the German Leopard tank, a uh, very capable uh, tank. It has a 120 um, millimeter uh, cannon that's associated with it, just like the Abrams does. Good armor uh, can be used in a lot of different environments, very maneuverable, and uh, it has a lot of firepower along with it, uh, but it has less required training time than the Abrams tank does. And the Abrams tank that you see right there, uh, that is one that is extremely powerful. It is basically the top of the line armor uh, vehicle that the U.S. uses uh, for uh, these kinds of purposes. Highly maneuverable, uh, but it uh, does require a lot of maintenance and a huge logistics tail in this case. And an advisor to President Zelensky says Ukraine is negotiating with Western allies uh, to access long-range missiles and aircrafts. How would that help change the war? And do you see this dynamic continue to play out where they get something and they say, okay, well, here's what's next on our wish list. Yeah, so there are a <laughs> lot of different things that they could potentially get. So uh, take a look at the ATACM system system, for example. This is a system that has about 190 uh, mile range and it can uh, really affect longer range areas. So it's considered a short range system, but it's long range enough that it would, be, uh, for example, go after Crimean targets. Uh, so if the Ukrainians want to go after Crimea, this is one thing that they would do there. Uh, now in the fighter jet world, this is an F-16 courtesy of the Danish Air Force in this particular case. Uh, but what it can do is it can move around uh, very maneuverably. It, it is a, you know, the top of the line aircraft, although it's almost 50 years old. Mm. First flight was uh, about 49 years ago. Uh, these aircraft are really the mainstay or have been a, until recently the mainstay of the U.S. Air Force. Uh, and there it's a real big part of the NATO inventory. And that's something though that they would require a lot of training on uh, anywhere, depending on the experience of the pilot, anywhere from three months, that's a real bare minimum, highly mm -hmm. unlikely, all the way to a year or more. Uh, so this training pipeline for all of these systems is going to be a very long one, a very tough one. Kim Jong-un's sister is weighing in on all of this, and she is denouncing the Western decision to send takes to Ukraine. She says the people of North Korea, uh, North Korea will always stand with Russia, quote, always stand in the same trench as Russia. Where do you see the war going next? So when it comes to the war, that's going to be a really interesting thing. So when you look at uh, what you have here on the main map, you have the possibility of the Russians coming in uh, not only uh, from the east, but also potentially from the south going into these directions. That's what they want to do. So if you go to a more detailed map of the eastern front, for example, the big fighting that you have around Solidar, around Bakhmut, uh, all those areas here become uh, that becomes a symbol for what uh, the Russians want to do. Now, Bakhmut by itself is not very strategically significant. However, it is on our main highway that goes this way. And if they can use that highway, that could potentially be a gateway for the Russians to move uh, forward into Ukrainian controlled territory. Uh, but uh, they're going to, in essence, try to work around a stalemate. The Ukrainians are trying to run the clock out and they're trying to make it so that they can fight the Russians and at the very least keep them here. But their real goal is to eliminate the Russians from this part right here, this so-called land bridge. That is where the Ukrainians want to move in the opposite direction and bring uh, the Russians in this way and uh, force them out of the country. All right, really interesting. Thank you so much, Colonel Cedric Layton.